The Read to Lead Podcast, Episode 4. Hey, this is Dan Miller from 48days.com, and you're listening to my good friend Jeff Brown on the Read to Lead Podcast. I think that we know intuitively what we're supposed to be doing with our lives, even if it's kind of like a vague notion, but we're afraid to admit it. Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast with Jeff Brown. Jeff believes that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, then consistent and intentional reading is a must. The Read to Lead podcast will not only help you narrow this ever important reading list, but also bring you key insights and valuable feedback from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. And now, here's Jeff. Hi, and thanks for coming back to the Read to Lead podcast. This podcast is dedicated to the belief that leaders read and readers lead. And my goal is to help you grow personally and as a leader by encouraging you to become a more intentional and consistent reader. Our guest today is author, speaker, and blogger Jeff Goins. If you're hard at work building your own platform, working on your personal brand, and attempting to position yourself as a thought leader in your area of expertise, then you're really going to get a lot out of today's conversation with Jeff. We'll get to that in just a moment. But first, today's episode brought to you by Get Abstract. Get Abstract produces each and every month 50-plus five-page book summaries. These can be read in just a few minutes. They even do audio versions of these same five-page book summaries that last about eight to ten minutes. If you like to get your book and get it fast, which uh, I bet is probably one of the reasons you listen to a podcast like this one, then Get Abstract might be very, very useful to you. It's real easy to sign up, and you can do it just by going to readtoleadpodcast.com slash summary. That's readtoleadpodcast.com slash summary. Jeff going is a blogger, speaker, and of course author, and he blogs at goinswriter.com, G-O-I-N-S writer.com. His first book, Wrecked, When a Broken World Slams into Your Comfortable Life, came out, was it was it last year, or are we going back yeah, to... Yeah, okay. it was last August. Okay, last August. It feels like it's been longer than that. Well, uh, Jeff's next book, The In-Between, Breaking the Tension Between Now and the Next Big Thing, is uh, due out just a few days after uh, this interview will be published, and I've known Jeff for a number of years, and I may be the only person alive who's ever interviewed Jeff for a job and not hired him. So, <laughs> so welcome, Jeff, to the show. Well, thanks, Jeff. Uh, that's not true because oh, okay. <laughs> uh, you, you would be you know, relieved to know that that rejection that you gave me was uh, one of many that I experienced that week. <laughs> you know, what happened was I uh, moved here uh, to Nashville years ago and, and I said to myself, if I can't get a job in a week, I won't, you know, I won't stay here. And uh, I had multiple interviews and got turned down for all of them, either too qualified or not qualified enough. And um, as I was driving out of town, I got a call from uh, a business who that wanted to hire me as a, um, you know, sales salesperson. And so I was, I was defeated. You know, I was driving out of town, driving back to Alabama to go, you know, go live with my parents again. And I got that phone call, and I was, I was just passing the business and pulled in, and they asked me to come in do an, another interview and. And offered me a job, and I've I've been here ever since. Not not doing that, of course, but um, yeah, it was it was uh, it's funny. It was funny to reconnect with you years later. And I wasn't feeling too bad about it because you're ob- <laughs> you're obviously no worse for the wear. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I mean, who knows where I would be if uh, you had hired me? So thank you. <laughs> well, let's begin by uh, bringing everybody into the loop uh, of, of where you've come from. Uh, you know, this, uh, for lack of a better way, of putting it, relative obscurity from a couple of years ago. Uh, share, if you would, that journey that began in, I guess it was 2011 until uh, uh, today. Sure. Yeah. So um, a, a few things happened. The first thing that happened was a friend asked me what my dream was. And I said, well, you know, I don't know. And then he kind of dug at me and eventually I admitted that my dream was to be a writer. And I didn't think of myself as as a writer, even though I'd written my whole life, uh, never done it really professionally. And so how could I consider myself a writer, which is something I hear a lot from people. Um, and uh, my friend said, well, Jeff, you don't have to want to be a writer. That doesn't have to be your dream. You are a writer. You just need to write. 
And uh, a lot of things were happening in my life that were confirming that this was something I, I ought to be doing. And so uh, in 2011, at the beginning of the year, like very beginning in January, I decided to start a blog, which I had done before. I'd been blogging for years, but like a lot of people, you know, I would like watch a movie and get inspired about something. I'm like, somebody should write a blog about that. I'm, <laughs> I remember watching that movie. What is it? Uh, Julie and Julia about, you know, Julia Childs and this woman who like did this food blog and it blew up and she got a book deal. And I was like, maybe I should do that. You know? <laughs> I got to start a food blog. Like I was chasing an audience. I was trying to, you know, get famous. And so as a result, I had all of these failed attempts at, at doing something worthwhile. And so I told myself, all right, like no matter what, I'm going to stick with this. I'm going to do the best that I can. And I'm really going to give this whole like building a personal platform thing a try. And, um, I knew that, you know, I've after pursuing all of those different opportunities that I was holding back, hedging my bets, not going all in because I was afraid of failing. So instead of going deeper with one blog, I would, I would go, well, well, maybe I should start this other thing and see if that takes off. And I was never really focused. And so I decided for this year, I'm going to focus and do this the best that I can so that if this fails, which it could, if this fails, it won't be a failure of effort. And so, um, you know, I, I started, I wrote a blog post a day for a year. Um, I got up from five, I got up at five o'clock in the morning and wrote from five to 7 a.m. every morning. Um, you know, I was reading our mutual friend, John Acuff, and, and he talked about getting up before, um, you know, your distractions do. So, you know, mm. there's not a lot of people emailing me or calling me at five o'clock in the morning. So I had lots of time to write. And so I started this blog and I started writing about something that I was trying to figure out myself, which was writing, you know, how to become a better writer, how to build a platform. And so I was just sharing these things as I was learning them and first slowly and then kind of like a, um, you know, a snowball rolling down a hill. It, it, it built a lot of momentum uh, pretty quickly. And uh, by, you know, in about eight months, I had a publisher approach me um, asking me to uh, write this book, Wrecked, that you that you mentioned, mm -hmm. and so um, so the first year I just built an audience, and by the end of the year I you know had about fifty thousand people visiting my blog, um, and I had an email list of over ten thousand subscribers, and this was just you know a year ago. Um, I now had a very expensive hobby, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was costing me hundreds of dollars to uh, maintain this blog and this email list. Yeah. And I, I met somebody at a conference who said, hey, that's a business. And in fact, that's a six-figure business. And I said, you know, I, I'm pretty sure it's not because <laughs> I have access to my bank account and it's like a two-figure business. So, you know, I think I got, you know, a $10 uh, yeah. tip at, at, you know, some free speaking engagement I did or something. <laughs> And, um, but, but, you know, she goes, no, it's, it's a, it's a business and here's what you need to do. And so I said, well, this is costing me money. I got to figure something out. And then my wife got pregnant and she wanted to quit her job and stay home and we couldn't survive off of just my income. And so I really had to figure something out. And so last year I just kind of experimented with doing eBooks, online courses, uh, selling affiliate products that were, you know, useful and helpful to my audience, just trying to figure out, can you actually do this thing that people talk about on the infomercials? Can you actually get paid, uh, you know, doing stuff on the internet? And I found out you could. And so, um, uh, by the end of my wife's maternity leave, we had replaced her income for the year. And so she could stay home and raise our son, which was the best feeling in mm. the world. And then a few months later, we had replaced my income. And then shortly after that, we had replaced my income again, at which point um, I decided it was time to talk to my boss and, and say, tell him that it was time to move on, uh, which was, you know, lots of people like, hey, that's great. You know, quit, do that. You know, that was actually a really somber thing. I really didn't want to quit my job necessarily, but I couldn't do both things well. And I really felt called to write more. And so we sat down and had probably close to two hour heart to heart. And I asked him for permission to leave my job. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't want to do this without your blessing. And, and he gave that and it was a really, um, you know, good, uh, you know, respectful kind of transition. Um, 
but yeah, and and here we are and doing the the writing and blogging and speaking thing full time and having a blast. And he wasn't all that surprised either. I mean, he he kind of knew that was coming, right? Yeah, You're... he 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 did, but I didn't know that he knew that. And it's it's <laughs> you know, it's like a lot of things. Everybody notices it, but you, right? Like everybody can see this coming, and you're like, no, 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 no way. Uh, and you're kind of in denial because it's scary to make that kind of transition. And I thought, man, this is stupid. You know, my wife is quitting her job. And she's like, I'm going to quit my job. We're going from two steady incomes to no steady incomes, mm-hmm. you know, one very unsteady income. Uh, but it was just, I mean, the writing was on the wall. And we, in a short amount of time, had really just uh, been rocked in terms of our expectations. And I had a friend say it to me like this. He goes, Jeff, a lot of people try to do what you've done. And this is rare. And, and you need to consider that not doing this, um, you know, uh, could be, uh, a, he said, it could be an act of disobedience to God. Wow. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> it made me realize that, okay, maybe this isn't about me at all. Maybe this is about, this is something that I'm supposed to do, and I need to respond to this. And I, I, I do feel that way. Uh, contrast for me, if you will, Jeff, uh, this epiphany you had of, well, you know, I am a writer. I'm going to start calling myself that. Uh, with this mantra I hear a lot lately, and I think someone just guest posted on your blog recently about it, this, this, this mantra I keep hearing of fake it till you make it. Those, I assume, aren't the same thing. Right. Yeah. So it, they're not the same thing. And I, um, this, I wrote an ebook about this called You Are a Writer, so start acting like one. Mm-hmm. And, and the reason I wrote about it was I, I started getting invited to conferences to speak on this thing that I'd done with my blog. And um, I didn't know what to talk about. And a friend said, talk about that, that conversation that you had. That seemed to be a really important thing for you, you know, that You Are a Writer conversation. And so I started doing talks about this. And there was this moment in the talk and I do this with lots of different audiences, not just writers, I will say, okay, there's this thing in your mind that if money wasn't an option, if you could do whatever you wanted uh, in life, you would be this thing. Uh, Write that down right now. And then in front of it, say, I am a blank. (laughs) And man, like I've done this for probably, you know, thousands of people now. um, And this is the one thing that I consistently get emails about. People come up and say, wow, that was the first time I admitted that I was a writer or an entrepreneur or an artist or whatever. Uh, And it is really empowering. And so I think that we know intuitively what we're supposed to be doing with our lives, even if it's kind of like a vague Mm. notion, but we're afraid to admit it. And so lots of people say, you know, so sometimes I hear people say, well, I can't say I'm an astronaut and then go, you know, get on a space shuttle and and fly (laughs) away. And that's true. And you can't say you're a writer and go write a best-selling novel. But what is true is that the best activity comes from a solid identity. And so if you aren't sure of who you are and you try to do stuff out of that poor foundation, it's going to be broken. But if you admit this thing that you have been sort of avoiding, but everybody acknowledges but you, um, then the first step is to go, I am this thing. I may not be good at it yet. I may not be a good writer, uh, but I am a writer and I'm going to get better. And so... Uh, it's kind of the opposite of faking it until you make it. It's mm. faking yourself out and going, yeah, you are this thing. Now get to work. <laughs> and faking it till you make it, you know, um, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know about that. I think that we have a core identity that we need to um, actualize in our lives. Uh, Thomas Merton talks about the false self and the true self. And most of us are living out of our false selves because that's the self that we like to show people. People tend to affirm that. But there is this secret self that we have that uh, we're afraid to share with the world because it might get rejected. Uh, but the problem is your false self is really a shadow. And if you're, if you're getting praise, you're getting high fives, you're getting paid for living out of your false self, mm. you know you're a fake and so um, I, I don't think that we really fake something till we make it. I think we act our way into becoming who we already are. Well, as you all know, the Internet has democratized a lot of industries, publishing and radio and television, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to the point that anyone who desires to has the opportunity to establish a platform and digging a little bit deeper into that. Um, you know, it, it, I take Michael Hyatt's book, for example, Platform Getting Noticed in a, in a Noisy World. If there was ever a case study for that book, 
it would have to be you. One need look no further than, than what you've done the last couple of years. And you wrote a series of blog posts recently that I, I found very fascinating and helpful. You called it the three secrets to building an audience. And I was wondering if we could maybe break each of those down one at a time, uh, starting with your assertion that success starts with your passion. Yeah. So um, I wrote that series uh, because this, this is the conversation that I have with folks when I sit down uh, and have coffee with them, which I don't get to do for everybody. This is the conversation that I have you know, when I meet somebody at a conference, and this is what I teach in the online courses that I, I conduct. Um, and I am no stranger to uh, this idea that you need to find a niche and then you need to like exploit that niche and then you need to have a blog talking about this topic and you talk about it over and over and over and over again and then eventually uh, you get published. Like this is kind of the what I think people say is like the secret to blogging success. Well, Jeff, I had tried that many times, you know, I talked about my cooking blog and my, <laughs> you know, this blog and that blog and I, I didn't get it. Like it wasn't working. And the reality was I wasn't writing from a place of deep passion. And so as an experiment, I decided, you know, forget this. I'm not going to, uh, I'm, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to chase an audience because I had written articles that ranked number one for a certain keyword on Google. And that didn't do anything for me because it was like, um, you know, chasing a trend, you know, like who wants to rank number one for, you know, something about Kim Kardashian uh, <laughs> in Google, unless you're Kim Kardashian. I mean, you're, you're living somebody else's dream. You're, you're chasing what other people want. And it, it, for me, it felt disingenuous. And so I knew that whether a hundred people or one person or a hundred thousand people showed up to my blog, I needed to make the decision ahead of time. I'm going to show up, I'm going to do my work and I'm going to love every minute of it. And if there are results that happen afterwards, that's great. But that's not the reason I do it. In that post or that series of posts in secret number two, you talk about what you have to do before people will listen to you. Is that in a nutshell uh, kind of approaching things altruistically? Yeah. And I mean, I like the phrase adding value. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, altruism is great. I mean, I don't think that you have to be completely altruistic in the sense that it's all about everyone. I just think it means that everybody has some sort of expertise. They have something that that they can use to help someone. And maybe it's stories from your life. Maybe it's uh, you know, a, a, just life experience it, itself. Uh, everybody can teach something. Everybody can help someone do something. And this, I think, really is the secret to um, attracting a large audience. I mean, passion makes the work sustainable. Uh, altruism, as, as you put it, or adding value uh, attracts people to you and goes, man, like, you're not about you, you're about me. And, and I want to hear more about this. And the interesting thing is the more you make it about them, the more they want to make it about you. And so it, there's this great kind of exchange of value where you keep giving and then the, uh, the right audience keeps giving back. And it's, it can be a lot of fun. And, and I've certainly experienced that, you know, reciprocity that, that happens when you decide to be more generous. You, you did a tele-seminar recently with uh, Michael Hyde that I just actually listened to earlier today. Uh, in preparation for this interview, and something you said really struck me because I had never really thought about it like this. You talked about the difference between writing from a worldview versus writing uh, about topics. Can you expound on that a bit? Yeah, so th this is is another one of those things that I, I don't think anybody is truly honest about, or not a lot of people are honest about, and yet the more I talk to best-selling authors and the more I look at people who are succeeding with large platforms, I go... Okay, everybody says like pick a topic and write about that topic and you know build you know target a niche and it feels like science you know but all of these authors and bloggers and communicators that are you know big deal and they've got these large personal platforms aren't doing that you know take Michael Hyatt for instance he's not just talking about a single topic and he could really talk about lots of topics leadership uh, publishing self-improvement or personal development, mm. uh, any number of subjects. And yet any given day of the week, you go to his blog and he could be talking about his marriage, 
uh, his church, uh, his last speaking gig, some new running shoes that he likes. So why do people listen to him or Seth Godin or Stephen King or Emily Dickinson? I mean, pick an author or communicator that you like. And when you get to the heart of it, they're not just writing about a certain topic. They're not even necessarily writing about a, a just one genre. Um, they are writing for a worldview. They are writing with a unique perspective and a more familiar term is a person's voice. And I think your voice is your unique style of writing, but that comes from a worldview. And, you know, common examples of worldviews are, uh, you know, the Democrats are screwing everything up (laughs) or the Republicans are screwing everything up. These are worldviews or the world is going to hell. I mean, that's a worldview or everybody's a good person. These are worldviews. And Mm. depending on how you view the world, it's going to affect how you communicate your message, how you tell a story, um, what kind of hope you give or don't give. Um, All of those are, you know, kind of injected into the message itself. And so something that I tell people a lot because it's true is uh, what you write about is less important than how you say it. Mm. Well, Jeff, in that the uh, focus of this podcast is on intentional and consistent reading and the success we believe uh, it plays in business and in life, um, tell uh, the Read to Lead Nation, as I have affectionately dubbed them, uh, what books you've been enjoying lately uh, that are challenging you and sparking you to continued growth. Yeah, great question. I have read more books this year than I probably have read in the past few years combined. Um, I've been slacking off the past few years. I used to read a lot, but uh, have kind of fallen behind. I just kept having lots of friends uh, recommend books, and I would like buy them, and then they, they sit on my shelf. And so, uh, a few months ago, I got an Audible account, and I just started uh, listening to lots of audio books. So, um, I like a lot of like you know, like I like a lot of nonfiction advice books. I've read. Um, uh, several business books that I really enjoyed. Uh, Think and Grow Rich is a, is a business classic, great book. Uh, the Millionaire Messenger by Brendan Burchard is a great book about how to become an expert. Um, the Millionaire Next Door, uh, uh, you know, I'm trying to get caught up on, on business stuff now that I'm a business owner. That's a great, that's a great book, not about, really about frugality, which yeah. sort of surprised me. Um, I uh, actually... Um, uh, you know, started reading some more uh, fiction and biographies uh, as well. I just read The Great Gatsby, which is a phenomenal book. And um, I'm reading a, I'm slowly getting through John Adams by David McCullough and mm. um, really enjoying that. It's very fascinating, but it is like a thousand pages. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I own that book, but I must have admit I, I have yet to read it, but I've had it in my, sh- on my shelf for like five years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I haven't yeah. gotten to it yet. Uh, and I'm like you, I, I, I got an Audible account a few years ago and never looked back. I, I hesitated for the longest time because I'm like, you know, my mind wanders too much. I had to train myself to pause the recording, let my mind do its wandering and be creative and then come back to it. And once I was able to train myself to do that, I'm, I've gotten so much out of that that app. Uh, I set a goal earlier this year to read a book a month, a pretty, pretty modest goal. And I realized by the end of March, I had read three books a month yeah. on average. So I, did, I just love it. Can't get enough of that. Yeah, I agree. Well, as you've grown as a leader these past couple of years, what were some of the biggest surprises for you along the way? Maybe some good ones or even some uh, not so good ones. So one surprise for me, particularly as um, a communicator, is that I like to be liked. You know, I think that... Uh, <laughs> I think that most of us who are trying to build a platform, if we're being honest, would admit that. And uh, if they won't, then maybe I'm just, you know, a little bit more self-indulged than I should be. (laughs) I don't like that about myself, but I go, man, I really, I like it when people like me and I don't like it when people don't like me. So um, the thing that has been really hard uh, to swallow is no matter what, somebody, in my experience, is going to criticize you. And I remember writing the most generous, helpful email newsletter to my subscribers. And it had been, you know, weeks since I had sent something to them. So like, wasn't pounding them with too much content. There was, there was no pitch. There was no, Hey, do this for me or anything. It was all giving. And I said to myself, cause I was sort of struggling with this. I said to myself, if somebody unsubscribes from this, then I, I just don't know, <laughs> you know, and I sent it to, you know, tens of thousands of people, large list. 
And inevitably, like with every time I send an email, you know, 50 people or something unsubscribed. And I was like, oh, no. Uh, but it just, it, it taught me you can be the nicest, best possible, most generous person you, you could be. And still somebody's not going to like what you have to say or they're not going to disagree with you or some people are actually going to hate on you. And it's so hard to disregard that because you want, you know, like I really want to get them to like me. Um, but, um, you know, I think a lot of people, some people blow those people off and other people um, spend too much time on them. I found the most gracious, healthy thing for me to do is say thanks. And, and, <laughs> and I think about it. And, and then, and then when it kind of falls out of my mind, I let it and I don't, I don't fixate on it. And if it really bothers me, I'll go talk to my wife and she'll say, Oh, that, that internet is so stupid. You know what? <laughs> Good grief. It, how could, pe- how could people just, you know, send around stranger via email, something like that? I can't believe that Lord, people are so, yeah. So, um, she she keeps me grounded, but that's, I think the hardest lesson is no matter how much good you try to do, there's somebody who's going to go, I don't like you. And that's mm. hard. Well, we're recording this in June, but this is going to be published, this interview, uh, around July the 23rd. So if I'm not mistaken, that puts us just days away from the release of The In-Between. Is that right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, as I've read up a little bit on this on your blog, I'm really excited about it. Uh, Not only the book itself, but the way in which you've you've chosen to launch it. And we'll get into that here in just a bit. But first, if you would, Jeff, uh, define for us what you mean by The In-Between Moments and, and share a bit about where the idea for digging deeper into this topic came from. So, Jeff, when I interviewed Seth Godin uh, a number of months ago, I asked him what his job was, what he does for a living, and he said that he names things. <laughs> and something that I, I appreciate about him is he does put names to concepts that we already sort of intuitively intuitively grasp. And once he gives a name to it, we go, yeah, that's what that is supposed to be named. Anyway, I feel like, you know, in a, in a lesser way, I've, I've done that with these two books with Wrecked and, and The In-Between, which is to say that if you've had an experience like this, uh, you can relate to that. You know, Wrecked is about when your world gets turned upside down. And I tell people about that book and they go, oh yeah, I can relate to that. I know mm-hmm. what that's like. And The In-Between, I like this topic because I think Everybody is waiting for something. Everybody is stuck between where they were and maybe where they want to be. And that maybe this is a job, uh, you know, a career path. Maybe it's, um, you know, waiting for your kids to get a little bit older so you can do more things and not have to be stuck in the house all the time. Maybe it's waiting to become that person that you've always longed to be and still are struggling with these bad habits or trying to lose weight or whatever. Everybody is waiting for something. And I began to acknowledge this, you know, going through kind of these early stages of uh, adulthood where um, waiting to get married. Okay, got that. Uh, Waiting to have a kid. Okay, did that. Waiting to launch my dream career. Okay, did that. And, And yet I still feel like I'm waiting for the next thing. And, and so, um, what if, uh, all of life is waiting And if that's true, then maybe we have a responsibility to, you know, certainly have aspirations and anticipate things and understand that there are big moments in life, but also to embrace where we are right now, be present to um, the lessons that life and I think God is trying to teach us and then see those opportunities to grow and, and become who we are. But understanding that right now, um, you know, to quote a Jack Nicholson movie, um, this is as good as it gets. Not to say mm-hmm. that your situation may improve, get better or worse, but h- how you choose to be right now and who you choose to be right now is the, is, is the best person you can be and the best thing that you can do right now. Because you can't do anything else. What can you do? You can look back at life or you can look forward. And so the book is, is just some stories and then some reflections on those stories from my life about these different moments where I was tempted to look ahead to the next thing and then learned a lesson about just stopping and waiting and being present to the moment. Uh, what is the official date of the launch? Is it August 1? August 1. August yeah. 1st. Okay. Well, just a few days away. I want to give you the chance because uh, there's not a lot of time left to pre-order the book for folks. Uh, give you the chance to share some of the unique content that folks can enjoy if they order it now. Yeah. Great question. Um, a uh, whole ton of stuff. Let me pull up the list in front of me because I, <laughs> good grief, I, I can't remember all this stuff. Um, yeah, so uh, we're trying this experiment with um, pre-orders, which I, I've not done before. But what I'm trying to do is tip off, you know, large book sellers that this is a book that they want to stock a lot of copies of. So we're doing, 
uh, we're, we're giving away a bunch of digital resources, including um, all copies of the book. And so one of the things that I hate uh, doing is, um, you know, buying multiple copies of the same book, like an audio book mm. and a print book and then, you know, an ebook. Cause I'm, you know, cause I may only finish one, but I like having all of them. <laughs> and so we're, we're doing that. So if you, um, if you pre-order the book, um, and honestly, uh, Jeff, if you order the book, the, the first week it's out, you'll get these bonuses too. Um, you get the, you get all copies of, of the ebook for whatever device you have. You get the audio book, which I just, uh, produced mm. and actually worked with somebody here in Nashville, picked out some music. Um, really excited about that. And, um, you, you get actually all digital copies of my last book, Rekt. So oh, okay. these, these books are kind of, um, connected in some ways. And so you get to read the, the prequel, if you will. <laughs> Um, there's also a reader's guide we're putting together. I have a 30 minute writing workshop talking about that. I am, you are a writer talk that I did. This is that. And I'm giving that away here. And then the best part, the thing that I'm most excited about is we are building this online community through a free newsletter, uh, with exclusive content and a Facebook group where, um, it's a private Facebook group. And the only way you can get access to this is by pre-ordering the book. Um, people can ask me anything about writing, building a platform, all of this stuff that I normally charge students hundreds or even thousands of dollars to teach them. Uh, if you pick up a $10 book, you get, you know, access to me and, and this cool community of, of folks that, that, uh, that we've built, um, which has just been kind of fun to see people, um, buy into that and, and it's a great way for me to kind of give back to other writers, communicators and, and folks who just want to, you know, uh, take the next step. And we want to uh, give away a copy, actually, of your last oh. book, Wrecked. Cool. Um, uh, we solicited uh, questions at readandleadpodcast.com. Folks can uh, click the send a voicemail button there and submit a question. And uh, our listener question this week comes from Alex. Hey, Jeff and Jeff. Uh, this is Alex Barker, and my website is alexbarker.org, home of the Leadership Dojo, Yeah, where I'm writing about how you can lead and master life at any age and soon launching a podcast. Woohoo! My question for Jeff is, which writers currently influence your writing, or, or um, which writers inspire you to become a better writer? I really enjoy your post, Jeff. Um, I actually really like th the worldview that you stand for. Thanks, Jeff and Jeff. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think I've, I've, uh, I've seen Alex online and familiar with his stuff. So, um, great question. Um, you know, th there are contemporary authors that I follow and then, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, old, older classics that, that I read. And in terms of classics, I really love Hemingway. Um, I, I think he, uh, obviously, you know, is, uh, in many ways is, is the father of, of modern fiction. And, um, what I love about him is he's short and almost like writes, you know, silly short sentences where you go, this, this feels like juvenile, but you understand that over time, <laughs> no, like this is, this is all it needs to be. It's, it's simple and compact and it has this momentum to it. Love Hemingway, uh, modern writers that I, that I follow. Uh, I love Seth Godin as a business writer. Um, I, I feel like he can distill big thoughts into, um, short little books and blog posts. Mm -hmm. I love Shauna Nyquist, who's actually wrote, wrote the foreword to the in between. Uh, she is one of the best storytellers, um, in, in, in my generation. She's, uh, she writes a lot of memoir. She's a brilliant author. And then I love, I love Steve Pressfield, both his fiction and nonfiction yeah. stuff. The war of art was, you know, life changing for me. And I, I love his, his blog. Um, he, he also writes very succinctly and, uh, you know, it has a punch to it. It really, it, it makes you act. And I, I like to model some of that writing for my own uh, readers. And so I, I know what that does for me as a reader. And I want to be able to, to pass that gift on of, hey, get off your butt or do something about this, or here's what you need to know. And so those are some, some writers that really inspire me. Well, you're giving back. You're, you've obviously inspired lots and lots of people as well. Um, Jeff, uh, before we wrap up here, um, obviously the book coming out on August 1st, The In-Between. Remind folks uh, where they can find you on the web, Twitter, et cetera, and maybe share with us anything else you might be involved in that you want uh, listeners to know about. Sure. So, I mean, people can find all that stuff at my blog, goinswriter.com. I'm 
at Jeff Goins on, on Twitter. Um, but if you go to goinswriter.com, you can get access to my free newsletter, some free eBooks there and, uh, you know, all the other social media stuff. Yeah. So, um, I mean, that's it. I, I, a few times a year I do an online course called tribewriters.com. And if, uh, you know, if you're a writer listening to this and you want to, you know, build a blog and, and do this sort of thing, that might be a, a cool thing to check out. Well, Jeff, thank you for your time. We've uh, very much appreciated uh, having you on the show, and uh, it means a lot. Your friendship means a lot, and we wish you nothing but success. Thanks, Jeff. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Read to Lead podcast. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with author, speaker, and blogger Jeff Goins. You can uh, find out more and follow up on the resources we talked about in today's episode, Read to Lead podcast.com slash slash 004 for episode four. I've been promising we would uh, give a shout out to those who had gone to iTunes and rated the podcast with a five-star rating. You can do that by going to readtoleadpodcast.com slash iTunes. Well, it's the first opportunity I've had to actually do this since uh, several of our episodes were recorded before the podcast actually launched. But I want to say thank you to Kenny Silva, also Jeff Sanders, P. Desmond, Michelle Jalen, Kyle Johnson, John Dumas of Entrepreneur on Fire, Stu Gray, Bam Hilton, uh, Leo Drummer, also Too Addicted, Luke Worsham, Jerry Sensing, Joe Morris 12, also MJ DeVry, and Scott Winter. All those folks, since we last spoke, going to iTunes and giving the podcast a five-star review. Thank you so much. Again, you can do that just by going to readtoleadpodcast.com slash iTunes. That'll help get the podcast noticed. And another way you can share about the podcast is by going to readtoleadpodcast.com slash Twitter. And when you do that, you'll find a, a tweet already filled in. You just have to push the send button and away it goes. And that's one way you can share about the podcast as well. I appreciate you doing that very, very much. And again, to find all the resources on today's show, including information about our sponsor, Get Abstract, it's readtoleadpodcast.com slash 004. See you next time. Thanks so much for listening to the Read to Lead podcast. As a subscriber, we challenge you to be more than just a passive listener. Become a vital member of the community. Visit us on the web at readtoleadpodcast.com and chat with other members at facebook.com slash readtoleadnation. Until next time, remember, leaders read and readers lead.